Hi, I'm Amanda Lisi. And I'm Chef James Regato. In this episode of Essential Cooking, it's just us, which is one of our favorite ways to do these episodes, when I talk with James about his latest travels to Italy. Well, these are some of my favorite segments when you and I sit and talk together and I get to ask you a ton of questions about food and anything else. And this time, we're going to talk to you about going to Italy. And we've talked about Italy before, and you've been there a number of times. But we want to take this one from a different perspective, which is you put this trip together really, really quickly. And I want to talk to you about how you actually traveled. We certainly will touch on the food, of course. But how did you, like, when do you decide, oh, I'm just going to go to Italy? How long were you gone? Two weeks or something? Yeah, I did a two-week I did a two-week trip uh, solo. Mm-hmm. And I think I planned it eight weeks out. I feel like eight weeks out was like the framework, like buy the plane tickets, depend, decide on the cities, and then get the in, you know the the domestic flights. Because mm-hmm. you have some choices usually. If you're going to go city to city, you you can do domestic flights pretty easily. So I bought the you know the to and from, which is a little bit annoying nowadays because with COVID we lost a lot of direct. Flights. Right. Mm-hmm. So Rome direct is only a couple months in the summer. So I had to fly. And this is my first tip for flying is I always want to have my layover in on the continent of which I'm going. Ah, okay. So I don't want to fly to Rome and have a layover in Atlanta mm-hmm. because you can get stuck in Atlanta. And Atlanta right. is great, but you're not you're not planning for Atlanta. Right. If I get stuck in Amsterdam or Paris, no big deal. Exactly. I could even like I could even like find a different quick flight, even if I have to say I'm going to buy a flight from you know from Copenhagen or from Paris or wherever to Rome. You can usually find something for like 200 bucks, mm-hmm. you know, quickly. So I always that's uh, really good advice. Yeah, and even like you know, same thing with like whatever Asia. If you're going if you're going to Tokyo and you don't have a direct, I'd rather you know. I guess like that's it. Tokyo is the wrong example. If you're going to Vietnam, I want to lay over. You know, maybe in Seoul or in Tokyo, because same thing. If you're stuck or if your flight gets delayed or whatever, then you're right. still in a great city. Yeah, your layover cities are more important than you think, and you mm-hmm. want to make sure the airport has the resources if you need to stay the night or if you need to get a cab or whatever. Yeah. So booking your layover is uh, very important to me. Where you do it, but the con- especially Europe, try to. I don't want to lay over in JFK because mm-hmm. JFK is notorious for you know delays. So I want to do it in in, in Copenhagen or in, um, in Amsterdam or. Uh, or Paris. Right. So once you decided how you were going to get there and you got those flights ready, then it's like, what are you going to do when you're there? Right. And how are you going to get around when you get there? So the first thing I did was I booked that walking food tour with Katie Parla's group because mm-hmm. we had her on the show. I wanted to check out that. that oh, we have great. to talk about that yep. after we just after we figure out how you got your way around. So I'm going into Rome. You know, you land, you land in Fiumicino, which is like, you know, 35-minute drive from the city of Rome, or you can take the Leonardo Express train, which goes direct from the Rome Termini, the central station. Mm-hmm. So I do a couple of days in Rome. I've been to Rome a bunch. I like Rome. Uh, it's not my favorite city in the world. I do love it a lot. Right. But like two, three days is good. So two and a mm-hmm. half days. And then I'm like, my cousin lives in Bologna. He's Italian. He lives in Bologna. And he was, uh, I, I, I kind of was like, hey, I got these two weeks. When can you join? And it was his birthday. So he's like, let's do Sicily for four days. So we were like, okay, cool. We book Palermo, and he books everything. I'm like, he's like, I got it. Don't worry. I'm gonna put it all together, and we'll just settle up at the end. I landed in Rome, and the floods in Bologna were crazy. He couldn't even get out of his house. Bologna was flooding. So he's like, you have to. He's like, I can't make it to Palermo. So like, I land in Rome. I'm going to Palermo in three days, and I gotta now figure out everything because he had the car, he had the lodging, he had everything booked. Um, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> But so I knew I was going to go to Palermo, so I bought a little uh, domestic flight from Rome to Palermo. And then I booked a flight from – because you're on an island, right? Sicily is an island, obviously. Mm-hmm. So you can't just you, – you, there is a train, but that's a, quite a distance. And, and you got to take – the train physically gets on a ferry. Oh, right. So it's it's a very – it's mm-hmm. cool, but it's uh, it's it takes time to get from, you know, from Sicily by train up, up north. So I, I booked a flight from uh, Palermo to Naples. I had three days in Naples. And then when I – I didn't book a train ticket because I knew it was going to be easy. The trains are very easy. Mm-hmm. So I, I I knew I was going to take the train from Naples to Bologna. And then I knew I was going to take a train from Bologna to Padua. And then I hired a driver, just a quick taxi, um, to drive me to the Venice airport. Mm-hmm. I like to fly out of Venice. Right. It's a little bit smaller and a more manageable airport than Rome, Fiumicino. 
So that's my little trick. I also have family up in Veneto, so it makes sense mm-hmm. to go up there. You know, so um, if you're not going up north, then obviously it doesn't make sense to fly out of there. But it is a way less stressful airport than than Rome. Um, so I, fly, I like to fly out of Venice. And then same thing, I landed in JFK because I want to be in the continent. Right. So I booked, Palermo, I booked Palermo. My cousin booked it. And then I obviously had to book it last second. And then the floods, literally, like the floods like went away and dried up like immediately. So he ended up. We kind of threw together a hodgepodge trip. So, like, I had already booked a hotel. So then he threw together an Airbnb. He scrapped his original plans. We got the Palermo. He ended up booking a car last second. And we still – we did most of the things we were going to do anyways. Mm-hmm. But it was like – you know, I am landing in Rome. And right when I get cell phone service, I get, like, you know, text, text, text. My cousin's like, oh, my God, <laughs> look at these pictures. Look at these videos. I mean, it was a, it was a national emergency. Like, highways were collapsing. It was, it was terrible. Bologna had some record floods right when I landed. So – and I'm supposed to go to Bologna at the end of this trip. And I'm like, okay, well, now I got to figure out. But, you know, it was a lesson in like, you know, let things kind of play out. Mm-hmm. So obviously I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to figure out. Going to Palermo with now with a no plans. I booked a hotel room. But other than that, I had no plans. Uh, it's kind of an opportunity. So I had the Katie Parla trip, the walking tour booked. Um, for the, where? For Rome. Okay. And then, you know, I use an app called With Locals. And I, it, it does a very good job of, of hooking you up with local food tours and local walking tours. Oh, that's cool. With, with locals, obviously. Um, I will say they take a little bit too much from the tour guides, in my opinion. So once I make a contact, I try to like – and this is a little cheat. So with locals probably going to hear me and, you know, they're going to try to block this. <laughs> but while we can get away with it, I always recommend booking a very minimal tour. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, one-hour walking tour. Get to know the city. And then once I'm in contact with the host, I say, hey – I want to go all out. I'm going to pay you in cash, like you know, because it's it's better for them. Right. The app gets their money still, mm-hmm. but the host gets taken care of. You know, I, I do this with Uber too when I travel. Like, sure, you, know, you get an Uber driver, mm-hmm. you get an Uber Black, and then you get his number, and you're like, hey, can you drive me? You know, mm-hmm. in Mexico City, can you drive me to the pyramids tomorrow? I'll pay right. you cash, and you know, this is it's good for everybody. Right. So I did that with a, a walking food tour in Palermo. I should, I'm sorry, a walking introductory tour. We didn't eat anything, but. I usually pick their brain on where should I eat lunch, where should I eat dinner, where's mm-hmm. the coolest bar, and they just and then you exchange WhatsApp information, and they're your they're your contact ah, the whole yeah. time you're in that city. So I literally booked this, these walking food tours within the first like hours that I'm in that city. I touch down, drop my bag off, and I want to walk with a local. I'm mm-hmm. um, even one hour because usually like you know I'll just like some people most what you, what you can rely on is in the world people don't tip well, right? You can kind of rely right. on that. Mm-hmm. So if I walk in, I'm like, hey, you know. Here's 50 euro, and they usually try to refuse to take it because, Mm -hmm. you know, tipping is obviously very American. But I'm like, listen, I'm going to reach out. I need you as a resource. Here's a little bit of cash. I'm going to – you're going to work for it, you know, down the line because I'm going to ask you, you know, questions. And then I'm going to – when my friends come here, I'm going to put you in touch because I want, you know, people to experience what I experienced. And I've done that a million times, you Mm -hmm. know, sent people to to tour guides that I've had. So we got a great introduction to Palermo, uh, learned kind of what to eat, where to go. We drove out to uh, Trapani, which is on the northwest coast of uh, of Sicily, and it's kind of where like a lot of Arabic influence in Sicily. That's that's a known thing, mm-hmm. right? But what's cool is that it still lingers in the food, some of the architecture too. But you can find a lot of like cool street food. Um, couscous is a really big deal in Trapani, and um, and then you can go uh, Ediche, which is like the medieval kind of like you know little village up in the mountains. So you take this little cable car ride up to the top, and you just. Look out over beautiful Trapani right there in the corner. It's where the two seas kind of meet. It's mm-hmm. like the Mediterranean, and uh, I can't always pronounce it, but the other, you know, the T H Y is like Tyrian, Tyrian C. Forgive me, I'm not Italian. Uh, I'm Italian American. Um, but it was where the two seas meet. So it's a really cool. It's a really cool little uh, little corner of Sicily. And then we flew. You know, it's, what's wild is like the weather was gnarly, and like I haven't had a lot of flights like this, but it was like. You know, my cousin's flight, because he was there an hour before me, like, it, like, went for the landing and then had, couldn't make it, and it pulled back up and, re- and spun around and did it again. Oh, wow. And so, like, and people were screaming, and alarms were going off, and, like, my flight was kind of <laughs> rough, too. Like, they kept, they, like, they, they told you about a water landing, like, four times, like, on the flight. Really? They're just reminding you what to do in a case of water. And I'm like, what are you, I was like, really, what are you guys talking about? Like, why are you telling us about the water landing so many times? But it was a really nasty weather. We, we were, obviously, we were fine. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, so flying in and out of um, 
Sicily was 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 pretty cool. Mm-hmm. I will warn you though, the, in the south of Italy, uh, Sundays matter a lot. It's very it's much mm-hmm. more much more Catholic. I feel like the usually you get into more like the you know I don't want like I don't want to say like poorer communities, but like the less resources, like the people that kind of live with a little bit less, like Naples and Palermo. Mm-hmm. Um, Roman Catholic means a lot more. Right. You know, there's a lot more. And there's almost superstition even involved. It's like, you know, you see like uh, Padre Pio, like, you know, you know the, the, the stigmata priest that's very famous in, in Naples. Like, there's definitely some Roman Catholic stuff, of course, but there's almost like a little bit of like New Orleans kind of like superstition in these cities. Do you feel like there's so much history there? Like, you must walk around and feel that this Absolutely. is just like, you know— America is still a young country in so many ways, but there's just so much history there that you must just feel it everywhere you go, certainly in the architecture and everything. But like those moments, too, where there's this, you know, communal sort of, I don't know if it's not a celebration necessarily, but a recognition of this part of their history. Definitely. And, you know, Roman Catholic in in Italy is an interesting – it's an interesting relationship because – you know, and not to get not to deep dive on, on religion, but like you know, a lot of Roman Catholic was kind of adopted by existing, you know, whether it was pagan or like other religions. So there's like, it, it goes farther back than just like than right. just the history of the Catholic Church. There's a lot of like, so in different parts of the country, it's like sometimes I feel like the Vatican is very like, you know, it's very opulent, it's very you know, mm-hmm. uh, very gorgeous, it's very it's it's like a lot, it's very kind of quiet. It's kind of like a it's like a pristine version of the church. And then you go down south and it's more of like superstition. It's, it reminds me more of like Dia de los Muertos or New mm-hmm. Orleans or it's like it's more it's more superstitious. Right. You know, it, it has more to do with like, you know, um, auras and vibes and energies and, and spirituality. Um, you know, there's a lot of murals. There's mm-hmm. a lot. I like, you know, when someone dies in Naples, for instance, and we're jumping to Naples now. Right. They'll kind of do like a mural like in the cityscape, like right in the wall somewhere. There'll be like mm-hmm. a picture of somebody and candles and kind of like a little oh. homage. Mm-hmm. Like Naples is wild because you're walking around like a tourist area. And but then like you like like in you walk down a side alley and there's like someone's house. But it's like a ground floor of a corner of an alley. And their front door is open and they're like making food and like the son's watching soccer and like the dad's outside having a cigarette, like across from where you would get a spritz or like next mm-hmm. to like a farm. It's like the city of Naples like lives in the city. You are like with the people. Right. And, like they're like they're there. And I mean it's it's really it's really unique to see that because I feel like a lot mm-hmm. of other cities like – gentrification or, you know, civil engineering is kind of bumped out or maybe like ground floor is a restaurant and then mm-hmm. everyone lives above it. Right. Naples is like you are living on this with the people in the street. You're living with them or you're, you're visiting with someone's, you know, mm-hmm. residence. It's, 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 pr- it's really cool. Naples is, Naples blew my mind. I loved Palermo three, four days and I was like very satisfied and I was ready to go to the next town. Mm-hmm. I did two and a half, three days in Naples. I booked a moped tour, so I got to see the city via oh, moped. Cool. I know, like you know, Capri, Sorrento, Amalfi, Pompeii. You know, the city center. It's all so close. You can li- I mean, you can visit like three islands. You can see a volcano. You can see the historic ruins of Pompeii. You can eat the world's greatest pizza. You, you and it's all right. I mean, it's right there. It was, it was. I was very. Uh, I don't want to say like upset, but I was very like. Confused why no one's ever forced the Naples on me. I feel like everyone's told me about Paris. Everyone's mm-hmm. pushed like you know you you hear the narratives. I've been to Paris like six times, and I'm like, dude, Naples dunks on Paris. It like dunks on Rome, and I'm like, why have I not gone to Naples before? Why do you think? I don't know. I think like all I've ever heard about Naples is like people are like, oh, it's kind of dangerous. It's kind of like Detroit. It's like you know, it's got a mafia history, just like Sicily, and and you go there and like it's got some grit. It's got some, it's got definitely some like uh, inner city kind of like, uh, you know, patina to it. Mm-hmm. But I, I loved it. I mean, I just, I, I loved Naples way more than I expected. I knew I was going to enjoy it, mm-hmm. but it, it like messed me up. I'm like, I'm dying to go. I'm going to do a week. And I think anybody that goes to Naples, I recommend a week. And the food there? Remarkable. This is where you get into street food. Pizza, obviously, right? And... You know, there's obviously there's different styles of pizza. There's the fried pizza. There's the, you know, the, the traditional, you know, margarita pizza. Mm-hmm. But then you can also get, like, you know, some of these guys are deep diving into, like, whole wheat doughs or, like, you know, they're they're, they're trying to get, you know, more. Um, somebody does, won't do the cornicione, which is, like, the really big puffy crust. That's kind right. of what you're famous, you know, uh, it's famous to see. So there's a lot of different styles of pizza, not just Napolitan. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I think I had four pizzas when I was there. Um 
you know, because I was alone, it's not as, it's not, you know, I wish I would have had more. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you get street food. So you have, you know, you have, you have a lot of like, there's a lot of options in Naples. You can eat cheap in Naples very easily. And it's delicious. I'm sure it's incredible. Yeah. You, you know, meatballs, the legend of Wednesday, which is like the onion, 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 and it's basically like onion braised meatballs. Very, very, oh. very humble and rustic. Um, yeah, you get the fried, you get like the basically the fried cup, like of all the different uh, vegetables, like the scraps of vegetables, and that it, sounds yeah. There's so a good. Lo- there's a lot of there's a lot of different street food in Naples, but there's a few serious like you know tasty menu restaurants too. And we'll be right back right after this. So let me ask you this. This is nothing to do with food or anything else, um, but a lot of people listening don't speak Italian. Mm-hmm. So it can be daunting for people to go to another country where they don't speak the language and try to get around the way you did. Um, what would you say about that, about trying to get around being an English-speaking person? You know, most most countries in Europe are really accepting of English speaking. You know, Italy I think has like sixty five million tourists a year. Mm-hmm. I think it's. I feel like I was arguing with my business business partner because he loves France and I love Italy, and I think France still leads, but Italy is one of the most visited countries in the world. Mm-hmm. So you you know the population there is totally accepting of English, and even if they don't speak English. The hospitality is is through the roof. You're going right. to get taken care of. You're going to you know Google Translate. Um, Kindness is a universal language, mm-hmm. so that that goes so far. I don't speak Italian. I mean, I, I speak, I can read a menu very well, right? You know, but I don't really speak Italian. But I'm just always kind, uh, patient. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you learn. I usually learn like you know, I'm sorry or excuse me. You know, so when you interrupt somebody, you say scusa. You know, like, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Like you know, right? And then you just say like you know, I don't, you know, I don't speak Italian. Like I'm so sorry. And like right there, just by saying excuse me, I'm sorry, forgive me. I don't speak Italian. Right. That's a that's a great gateway. Just mm-hmm. you, just li- literally learn. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Pardon me. Mm-hmm. Please, you know, l- learn some polite, you know, sayings, and you're going to be just fine. That's pretty cool. But I mean, there's a lot of places that in the smaller like Abruzzo, it's tougher to find right uh, English speaking. But like I said, kindness goes a long way. And have cash. Get get euros. Have have cash. Also, euros. This is this is very important. Euros um, go up to like five hundred dollar bills, mm-hmm. two hundred dollar bills. Nobody has change for those. Like you're you're going you're visiting mom and pop shops. Right. Italy, it's very hard to be like capitalism doesn't really exist in Italy. It's kind of hard to jump a class. Mm-hmm. It's hard to make uh, a lot of money. So when you're going to a store, you know, I mean, if you have a five hundred euro bill, I mean, you're Good luck. Banks won't exchange it for you. Like, you can't. If you go to the currency exchange, they're like, "Get out of here." We exchange U.S. dollars for euros. Uh, right. They don't break euros. Mm-hmm. So, when you go to your currency exchange in America, do not touch five hundred dollar euros. I mean, unless you're talking about, unless you're buying like a car over there or something. <laughs> so yeah, definitely. That's great advice. Twenties, you know, tens, twenties, maybe fifties, depending on where you're eating. Mm-hmm. Uh, even a hundred is very hard to break. That's really good advice. So you and I spoke with Katie Parla. That was a great interview. And um, you went on her tour over there. I did. I went with one of her colleagues. Tell tell me what that was like. So we met in Testaccio, which is the old uh, – it's actually where she took Stanley Tucci mm. on his episode. Oh, okay. And Lombardo, Anthony Lombardo was really insisting I visited Testaccio, which is basically their old slaughterhouse area. Mm-hmm. And it's been rehabbed into, like, housing. And where and is this located? This So this is this is in this is obviously in, in Rome, but it's right. a little bit south of the center. So it's kind of across the river. Oh, okay. Um, it's you know it's like you know it's 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 obviously in the city it's in the city center because back in like the ancient days you wanted to have this close enough right. to the city but you want it on the water so you can move so it's right on the river because right. you obviously want to move animals and different things in and out of the river right um, so it's 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 relative it's in the city center it's walkable I mm-hmm. walked there from my hotel oh, okay. and my hotel was like right in the center I think I was like you know a five minute walk from the Trevi, uh, Trevi Fountain so I was pretty pretty central right and then it's yeah I walked there maybe like a mile. You know, stay near the Coliseum. It's about a, a mile from the Coliseum, and we walked. You know, basically the farmers market. There are some people doing, um, you know, butchery things still. I had the uh, payata, which is basically um, the veal intestine that is still full of milk 
from obviously being milk fed. They tie it off. It looks like a little caramelly pasta. And then they braise it in like tomato sauce. So it basically is like a cheese filled pasta Mm -hmm. is kind of how it tastes. But it's a milk filled veal intestine. So this is, it's remarkable. It's wow. Very, it's very delicious. It's a classic Roman dish. Right. You don't see it too much. Mm-hmm. I think that's— Had um, you ever had it before? No. I've had veal, I've had, I've had veal intestines. Even in uh, in Sicily, they do a lot of grilled— I mean, intestines are right. commonly eaten. Mm-hmm. So, like, you know, there's usually, like, it's the casing even for a lot of sausages and stuff. Right. So, you know, I've had intestine, but never this milk-filled. And it was really kind of crazy because you're eating and you're like, this is— like a pasta. It was like a cheese stuffed pasta. Mm-hmm. And I think for the average person listening, they're probably grossed out by hearing that. Right. But it was, you know, and we talked about that when we had, you know, uh, when we talked to the vegans, Jessica Hayes and, and Sadie, mm-hmm. you know, you go to some of these cultures and like, you know, this is what they've always done. Right. And it's like, you just kind of, I, I have a tendency just to tap into whatever, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's eating bugs in Mexico or, right. you know, eating veal head in, in France, you just kind of, you know, I mean, eating all sorts of crazy things in Vietnam. I just usually tap into what they're doing locally and just mm-hmm. try to, you know, experience it from a local's perspective. And that's definitely a very Roman butcher's dish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, so we walked around the market. I actually sat down at a natural wine bar. We're sipping a glass of wine. And the guy next to me is like, oh, are you – oh, you guys American? And, you know, the guide was like, oh, he is, you know. And, and uh, he's like, oh, I'm a chef. He's a chef in Nashville. He works for uh, Tony Montuana who came from Chicago. So, like, Eric Lees from Bassan is, like, used to work with this guy. So, I'm like, oh, yeah, I know Eric. And he's like, "Wow, he knows Vermiglio. We just were, you know. yeah, he, That's we're, so crazy. So random. So, uh, yeah, we just, we're, we're, we're chumming it up. But, yeah, I mean, chefs, obviously, are, chefs are traveling. You mm-hmm. know, that's a that's a very, that's, that's not the craziest thing to come across a chef. Right. Traveling and eating around yep. Rome. Um, before you, you and I talked about this at one point, and I thought this was interesting, too, about how you eat when you get back from a trip like that. Oh, straight detox. So you really give your body a break yeah, when you I'm, get back. Because part of your, I mean, part of why you travel, I know you love to travel, but part of it is, I'm sure, to get inspiration because you're a chef and to be in other cultures and how they cook and how they, you know, what they do there. And so you're consuming a lot, I assume, when yeah. you're there. Um, how do you usually feel when you get back? And I say this because when I was in Italy, I ate pasta every day and pizza almost every day and I felt great Mm -hmm. like I didn't feel the way I feel sometimes here which is the bloat and the uncomfortableness after having all that gluten and what have you and it really struck me at how I didn't feel like that when I was there no I mean the relationship in Italy with digestion is huge they're very obsessed with digestion you know we talked about that with Katie yeah with Katie yep and you know you yeah I mean I feel I mean I I think I was walking about 25,000 steps a day so I didn't actually, oh, yeah. I didn't like have a, I didn't feel like I gained a bunch of weight on this trip or anything. But yeah, when I come home, I detox, I usually go vegan and I go sober and I just, especially sober, you know, mm-hmm. alcohol is such a, mm-hmm. it's such a slippery slope. You oh, know, you sure. got to really get it in check when you come back from a trip. And yeah, I mean, you have, you have to sober up and uh, detox your body, especially, I mean, the American food s- you know, system is so broken. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, we talk about that a lot, sure. but like it is, it's painfully obvious when you go to another country eat, you know, feel it. Wow, this is great. I can eat pizza every day. If you came here and eat pizza every day in Detroit, you'd be in trouble. I'd be wrecked. You'd be in big trouble. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, our flour, our, you know, our, everything from our milling, the distance between the, our ingredients and our plates. Um, yeah, I mean, Italy has such a high standard from the production standpoint. Um, and usually when American influence enters a country is when they start having more problems. You know, I mean, our, we are, we, we have a lot of great things in America. Uh, food system is not, is not one of them. Right. Exactly. That's something, I mean, is it fixable? I know we're getting way off the rails from sure, trip sure. to Italy here, but it is a problem. Uh, is it fixable? It's a good question. You know, if you look at, it's funny, I was just in, I was just in Rome. Well, what, do we, what is Rome famous for, right? The fall of Rome. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they, Rome at one point had, you know, I mean, they, they created the aqueducts, they built the highways. I mean, they, they basically ran Europe. Obviously, they completely collapsed. So, like, these grand things collapse, you know, big things, you know, die. So I think that like our food system, the way that it is, uh, it has to change. I mean, at some point, right. Whether it's climate change, whether it's, you know, uh, 
economy, whatever, you know, it's good. Yes. I mean, in the short term, what, yes, it's going to change, whether that's through collapse or through rehabilitation mm-hmm. or through reform. The way that we dine in America, the way that we rely on food systems is not sustainable. So, mm-hmm. yes, it will absolutely change whether we like it or not. Um, hopefully, we can adopt the models of the successful food systems of the world. That's what I'm hoping for. That's what I work for. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I mean, I you know, it depends on how bleak I'm feeling in the moment to answer that question. <laughs> I do have one question. This might be a little bit of a cliche question, but what that you ate over there, would you jump on a plane tomorrow to eat again? You know, after I left Naples, I took a train to Bologna. And Bologna is in Emilia-Romagna. And Emilia-Romagna, I've, you know, people will say is the breadbasket. It's one of the most important food regions, arguably the best. You know, if you look at prosciutto, if you look at uh, Parmigiano-Reggiano, balsamic, mortadella, these things all come from Emilia-Romagna. And really, the relationship with mortadella, that just stays with me. I, I think about mortadella. I crave it in a different way. Um, I had a, you know, there's a, there's a mortadella lab. It's what it's called, a little sandwich shop. It's incredible. It's like a five-euro sandwich. People line up around the block for it. Um, that stays in my head. And then, you know, Ferrari, the museum, uh, you know, well, Ferrari, the you know, obviously the, the car company mm-hmm. has a museum. And their restaurant, Restaurante Cavallino, I think it's been there for decades. And they basically rehabbed it with the help of Massimo Bottura, who's the most famous chef in Italy. He has Osteria Francescana, which is a three Michelin star restaurant in Modena, which is where balsamic's from. You've usually seen balsamic vinegar of Modena on the mm-hmm. bottle. So Modena is the city. Um, so that's where Massimo is from. So Massimo is, I mean, this guy is like, this, I mean, he is a, he's like a patron saint of Emilia Romagna. The contributions he's made are, are remarkable. He can't, his impact can't be overstated. Like, you know, we have Thomas Keller. America has, like, Grand Atkins. We have some big chefs. Massimo is, like, I mean, this is, he, like, is this juggernaut. So Ferrari basically approached him and said, can you help us with our restaurant? Because it's, like, you know, it's, like, more or less the cafe restaurant to the museum. Oh, okay. So they, it's kind of like their, their little place to eat when, when tourists are in town. Because mm-hmm. it's in a little village. There's not a lot to do in the little village. And he was like, yes, but we have to overhaul everything. It's like it's a complete remodel. So they remodeled everything. And the menu is a la carte. It's very it's very approachable. It's very light and delicious. But it's – I think one of his old chefs from the restaurant is running it now. And it's such a well-done restaurant. I mean, and you, they, they touch on the classics, obviously. You're going to see things like, you know, tortellini and brodo and, you know, classic, you know – you know, dishes of this region, but they were so modern and so well done. It was by far the best meal that I had. And I had, I had multiple, you know, Michelin meals when I was there and like, this just blew it out of the water. And it's like, they're probably doing hundreds of covers a day. Very, very busy. But the other thing Emilia Romagna is known for is, uh, Lambrusco, sparkling red wine, right? I had a few champagne method Lambruscos from Cantina della Volta, it blew my mind. So to answer your question, long-winded, the best thing I ate was actually something I drank because I'm obsessed with champagne. Right. You know that. And there's a producer, Cantina de la Volta, they were doing champagne method Lambruscos, and they're completely turning Lambrusco on its head. They're showing off the grapes, the terroir, in in the most elite way that you can show off sparkling wine. Had you this. tasted anything like this before? Not, not, no, not from, I mean, there's, some of them are so close to champagne, it's almost hard to tell they're not uh, champagnes, okay. mm-hmm. but some of them were done so well to show off the grapes of the region and the terroir that it was, it was, uh, you know, I feel like it was very Italian of them to say, we can do that too. You know, it was, uh-huh. it, was, it, was it, it felt like, you know, it felt, uh, it felt very inspiring to kind of have a conversation about Lambrusco because mm-hmm. Lambrusco sometimes has a bad reputation. Right. And then shortly after this uh, this restaurant and then the Lambrusco tasting, we went to uh, Juicy, which is basically um, a, a balsamic producer. So we had some really cool old balsamics. Learned a lot about balsamic, the history of it. Um, so I kind of got to get a, get a good close-up look at some of those classic ingredients. I mean, I've used balsamic so many times in my life. Right. Sometimes you kind of like take it for granted Mm -hmm. and sort of visit it and go slow and look at the barrels and walk the, you know, walk the floor and kind of be with the production. You're like, okay, this is, now I remember why it's so, now I remember why it's in every cupboard, like in the modern world, why everyone has balsamic is because of its, you know, how, how special it is. So yeah, the best things that I ate weren't necessarily plates of food in a restaurant, but more so the sourcing of ingredients. All right. Well, I'm sure your next adventure is coming up pretty quickly. You don't sit still for very long. Yeah, I don't. You know, I'm looking at, I'm going to Mexico 
in the fall, but I'll, pro- <laughs> I'll probably try to squeeze in a country before then. I do about five countries a year. And, uh, you know, yeah, my, my recommendation to everybody is, for one, get your passport because the passport, you know, it takes, mm-hmm. it's, I think all the passport offices are so backed up right yep. now. So get your passport. Just I don't care if you don't have a plan or not. So number one, get your passport. Number two, don't be afraid to travel wherever you go. Number three, book a walking tour the second you land in a city. This is something I didn't do for too long in my life. I thought it was like touristy and I avoided it. Absolutely wrong. It gives you the key to the city. Tip your tour guides real cash in their hand and then exchange WhatsApp. Get the WhatsApp app and then you can text people around the globe and then they will be your resources. I mean, I've had my friend in Oaxaca, Omar, who gave me a wonderful walking tour. He's the one that told me about Ana East that we interviewed. And oh, she yeah. gave me the mm-hmm. walking tour in Mexico City. Right. So like, you know, you, these th- these little puzzle pieces fit together and eventually you start having – resources around the world that change the way you travel. It's all, we are all connected. It's like, really, I mean, the more I travel, the more I realize it is a tiny planet and we are all connected, especially in the modern day. Thanks so much for listening to Essential Cooking. If you've been enjoying our show, please drop us a review and share it with a friend. This podcast is produced by me, Andalisi, with my co-host, James Rigato. This episode was also produced, engineered, and edited by Connor Anderson, with production support from David Lyons, original music by the Mallet Brothers. Essential Cooking is a production of WDET, Detroit's NPR station.